Hey, and hello and welcome to the first coronavirus shun-in session of the pandemic 2020. Uh, my name is Bruce Bissett, and for those who are new to me here, let me go back to something else here. Hi! I hope yesterday's problems were fixed. Today we're definitely um, going to be getting our, our, our session started this morning. Again, my name is Bruce Bissett from avionicseducation.com. And I wanted to provide you something today that was not about uh, anything that had to do with uh, a headline uh, about how we're in a budget remake of Z. So we're going to start today with a session about transponders and radars uh, on radar. So let me keep on going here. Sorry for the pause. Okay. Again, my name is Bruce Bissett from avionicseducation.com. And we're going to start today with a technical training section that I had done when it's part of my avionics program well, that I taught many, many years ago. Um, many years ago, like three years ago, that program ended. When it did end, I took with me 650 hours of training materials that included the PowerPoint presentations. We had labs, tests, uh, I even wrote the six textbooks that came with the program. Uh, the avionics part of it was tied in with the uh, AMP mechanics program, and it was quite successful in that it, it just was, other than it being expensive. So I went on to other projects, and the avionics training was set aside for me. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to be able to put something out now with all those materials and make it available to everybody, especially the NCAT certification uh, that I had uh, created in years past. So today's subject is going to be about ADSNB, Automatic Dependent Broadcast Surveillance. Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast, excuse me. So we'll start with how do we get here? So let's begin today. What is the purpose of the ADS system, or why did, how did we get here? So, bef originally, right now, the original air traffic control system, oh, let me rephrase that. The purpose of the ADSB system, there we go, was to provide another tool for air traffic controllers could use to provide aircraft separation in an ever increasing air traffic control system. Ground-based radar was the key to just do that. If we look at a photograph, this was a live shot taken a few years ago of what was in the active airspace over the United States and some part of uh, Canada. Uh, that's a lot of aircraft in the air at any one time. And air traffic controllers, their primary purpose is to keep those airplanes, or little targets, from hitting each other. Okay. So, originally when radar came about, it simply just put a target on a screen. It was designed during World War II to uh, alert um, air traffic controllers in England during the Blitz of where to send their very limited assets uh, around the world, around the world, excuse me, when aircraft were attacking. Hang on. Why is this not working? Well, this is good. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Well, I try to figure out my uh, glitch problem here. There we go. So we'll come back to it. Um, again, identification friend from foe became a real issue. In other words, when the radar systems were first put into place, what would happen is that we didn't know what they were. So the first transponder system was a way for air traffic controllers at the ground in English to be able to go through and to send what's called a response. The original system was called Parrot and operated as an ask-tell response passive system, meaning that if a ground controller wanted to know the identity of a target on the scope, that person would activate a transponder uh, such as this. This is one of the original transponders. And if the aircraft was, uh, was set up correctly with today's squat code, which was a four-digit number, 
it would respond on another frequency, which was the 1090. So back in the day, it was 1030 interrogation from the ground uh, to a 1090 reply from the aircraft. And then that would cause a bloom or a scope to come up or an indication to come up on the screen. So this was the basis really of all transponder systems today. So I wanted to show you that this was the transponder box there. You can see it. And we still use the 1030 ground interrogation frequency and we still use the 1090 response code today. So from 1945 until about 1980, the transponder code system had two modes. We had mode A, which, one, which provided air traffic controllers uh, a four digit number assigned by controllers, could be as part of an IFR flight plan or could be as part of a, a VFR pilot flying in the aircraft, meaning uh, not under air traffic control. So that was mode A. Mode C was the second mode and it was a second transponder question, and that was the pressure altitude of the aircraft, or the true altitude, depending on where it was in the system. And this worked fine for many, many years until the traffic, until the airspace started becoming congested. Later on in the late 80s, the two-mode system was augmented with a third system called Mode S, or 1090ES. If you're wondering what 1090ES stood for, that stood for Extended Squitter. And what it did is it provide more information uh, to air traffic controllers about not only its altitude and its, and its assigned number, but now you're getting IKO addresses. You're actually getting positional information. And uh, you're also getting uh, other, like for example, for an airline, you'd have the flight number information, which would be tied to, and the flight number information would be tied to the flight plan for controllers. So air traffic controllers had a lot of information that was being provided onto the scope and could be called up now, the mode uh, S system and A system and C system all operated within the radar line of sight process uh, of, of air traffic control, meaning that uh, only if the aircraft was replying to transponder signals could it receive information in mode S if it was, if it was applied for mode S. Now, mode S is still required today, and we'll talk about that in a second. So, what led to the next level, or the ADSB? And there was a couple reasons. One, high traffic congestion was a big one. We were having more and more aircraft, and more and more aircraft in the system, both being controlled and uncontrolled, would actually cause problems on the scope uh, when it came to identification of aircraft that were operating, whether it was under control of the controller directly or just transitioning the area. And the other problem that... ADSB was designed to solve was the problem of poor radar coverage, meaning that because um, the radar system and the transponder system only worked within line of sight of the ground station, this meant that the uh, that the information from mode S could only be received if it was in line sight. And if you're talking about aircraft in mountainous terrains or out over the ocean, uh, that would be out of radar service pretty quick. So, so what is ADSB? Well, we'll talk about what its definition is. ADSB, breaking down the name, A, D, S, and B, just simply A is automatic. There's no interrogation needed to start uh, data or squitter coming from the transponder. Original mode A and C required an interrogation from the ground station before it would put a reply. The ADSB system was designed to now, instead of communicating directly with air traffic control through the radar uh, ground unit, now it's going to communicate using both satellite and ground, uh, ground based um, responder system. Dependent in that it relies on onboard navigation and broadcast equipment to provide information to other ADBS users. Meaning that when the system's installed in the aircraft, it provides now GPS information, aircraft information, uh, all the time, not only to air traffic control, but also to any other aircraft who has the ADSB in format. And that's what we're talking about, uh, talk about in a second between the ADSB out and ADSB in. And of course, surveillance, meaning it's automatic. It's an automatic surveillance system for traffic coordination. The plan is, is in the future, 
uh, air traffic upgrading through next gen will go through and increase the capabilities by allowing more automatic air traffic controls. In other words, instead of providing a pilot with verbal communications to speed up or slow down, the ADS-B system will then actually provide information electronically to the cockpit, and then the pilot would just simply have to respond to it. And that's the basics of the system. We'll look at the diagram here. The basics of the system is that we have a ground transceiver that will send communications uh, links between air traffic control and a comm link on the ground sites and a satellite system. The aircraft will send out a couple notes here. Uh, it'll send out out, which is the requirements after 2020, January of 2020. It sends out an out format. Who are you? What is your altitude? What is your GPS position? And in that way, uh, a higher level GPS position information had to be required than previously. In other words, wide area augmented system or wall system. Okay, with that information, the out system could communicate directly to the ground system. It could communicate with other aircraft, aircraft that were equipped with the in system. And at the same time, it also could communicate uh, between air traffic controller stations. So where did it start out with? Well, the biggest problem in the first test areas was the ADSB in the Gulf of Mexico, where it has 3,800 drilling rigs up to 400 miles out into the Gulf. In weather, the weather in the Gulf is notorious for hurricanes and low visibility. Obviously, you're not flying aircraft in hurricanes. Okay, now most of these platforms are located far out past the coverage of aircraft radar system. In fact, 70, 90 miles out, and you're blind to radar at low altitudes. So with traditional coastal ATC RBS, ATC stands for Air Traffic Control Reply Beacon Systems, mode A and C, the radar service is 70 to 90 miles offshore. So what to provide separation for the helicopters that were operating under IFR, what air traffic control had to do was they had to close large spaces of airspace, 20 by 20 mile square, uh, to all other traffic until the helicopters could reach a VHF communication checkpoint, or they could talk to company radios. The helicopter's position was then relay, uh, relayed manually to Houston Air Traffic Control for position verification. Back then, the navigation, before GPS, was done either by dead reckoning, time, speed, distance, and direction, or if it was a more modern aircraft, had inertial navigation systems. Now, the addition of GPS navigation systems means that now the position reporting became more accurate, but it still required a verbal communication with VHF radio. So what air traffic control wanted and what the system was tested was to be able another method of provide continuous coverage. So in December 2009, the Next Gen program moved forward with the ADSB installation for the Gulf of Mexico operations. In addition to airborne equipment, the FAA installed VHF ground stations throughout the Gulf that communicated with the coastal controls via the satellite links. So in addition to the satellite communication, you had all the drilling, drilling stations had communication links. The aircraft could then be displayed on a screen to air traffic control to allow the controls to provide aircraft separations. Now, aircraft uh, helicopters and the crews can be directed straight to their oil platforms and not having to shut down the airspace like they used to have before. So now more aircraft is being provided in the system. The other benefit of this is because you had real-time positional information to air traffic controllers, that meant the traffic collision avoidance system was activated. So if helicopters became uh, in a collision situation, then air traffic controllers, or it's like aircraft themselves, could provide TCAS warnings. So as a result of the Gulf of Mexico program, the FAA has moved forward with the implementation of ADSB installation requirements for the rest of the U.S., so what was learned about the Gulf program is that pilots and controllers were provided with more precise information about the location of aircraft and um, to be able to allow them to navigate to and from their destinations. As a result, the national airspace system was much safer, near misses were uh, greatly reduced, and you had more air traffic in the area. 
So today, the ADS-B system is installed and operating. Right now, all the aircraft that want to operate in a certain airspace, and generally speaking, it's the same airspace that was required to have the Mode C and Mode A transponder certification. Now Mode C becomes uh, into effect, and I'll talk about that in a second. So that means all aircraft having to have out information must be able to be, to be able to operate in the airspace, uh, and it must be functioning. So the question becomes, what is the maintenance requirements for this equipment? Okay, once it's installed, we all installed it using uh, STC data for the most part, because most manufacturers had not updated their equipment lists and their maintenance manuals to the new equipment when it was designed. So what they did is they went through and would put it uh, included in the supplemental type certificate, and then each system would have instructions for continued airworthiness, or ICAs. <clears throat> Once the aircraft is installed, the system is operating, it's tested, then it has the same inspection requirement as any piece of avionics equipment in, the, uh, in an aircraft. Uh, for example, when we do an annual inspection on an aircraft or part of an inspection program, we're going to look and ensure that is the system operating normally? Is it clear and readable? The displays uh, indicating properly? <clears throat> Are the controls on it functioning? Are they clear? Is everything about it secure? That is the basic uh, avionics uh, inspection of any equipment that's in the aircraft. But what about certification or recertification? Now, most equipment, most aircraft that were required to have the extended squitter or ES or mode S were already on maintenance programs that included air data computers. So they didn't have the FAR part 91 uh, 217 altimeter correlation inspection that now the new ADS-B out system is required to have. So even with the universal access transceivers, the UASs, let me show you the next slide, the uh, UAS system, they still required to use or they, they read the altitude information from the mode uh, C output of the transponder, which means for that system to be current and function in the aircraft, it must have a valid uh, what we call the IFR transponder pedostatic check. And that has to be done every two years. So that was really one of the big changes for maintenance of the ADSB. Uh, every time the aircraft flies, we talk about the individual maintenance, the FAA will monitor the output of the signal. If the signal becomes suspect or the signal has a problem, what will happen is that, let me change the scene here. What will happen is that there we go. There I am. What will happen is that the um, uh, air traffic control will send a letter to the aircraft registered owner to let them know that they had an invalid ADSB mode. And on a future uh, video, one of the Ask the FA questions and also U uh, Avionics Education YouTube channels, I'm going to cover reading that port when it comes in. Uh, a lot of the questions that people had had to do with, for example, what is a latency failure? Um, what were some of the main common errors that were being reported by ATC and then really what it meant? Uh, but with that being said, what was required is that that was it. There's no continuous maintenance or periodic test outside that as soon as you start turn on the system, the vast majority of the systems had built-in test equipment. If there was a fault or failure, there would be an indication as part of, part of the installation. Let me go back. Sorry about that. So form fitter function where the boxes are, security, all that stuff is still replies, applies to this piece of equipment. And can you see the codes? Is it working? Is it connected? Is it putting out output? And keep going through and make sure here I got everything. Uh, is the antenna secure and functioning? Is it dirty? Remember, these antennas, when they become dirty, actually will affect the signal of the um, uh, output or the input from the GPS. Uh, some other problems that they're having is that somebody forgets to put a WAS capable GPS and leaves the old GPS system installed. That can happen. Um, again, looking at the other antenna, if I'm using a universal access transceiver, like I said before, there was two types of systems that could be installed. A mode S or what they call 1090 extended squitter. And the other one was a universal access transceiver. 
And this universal access transceiver, if you didn't know that, is actually only good in the continental United States. You can't fly to Mexico and you can't fly to uh, Canada with the equipment or Europe. And you can't fly in the positive control airspace or PCA with it. If I fly above 18,000 feet or one flight level 180, I have to have extended or uh, 1090 ES. So the universal access transceiver then has an extra antenna. It'll have a communication antenna uh, on the bottom of the aircraft. Uh, to be able to communicate with the ground stations. Okay. There is a requirement that somewhere on the panel there is control or indication uh, that you could turn the system on if it doesn't have an air squat switch that the system can be uh, uh, can be turned on manually uh, or if it fails it provides an indication to the pilot of a failure. Again all that stuff has to be functioning. So real quick I want to talk about testing here. Uh, right now, the only piece of test equipment I'm aware of, there's a lot of specialty equipment. Um, here's an example of just an, uh, a, an IFR uh, 6000 from, at the time, Aeroflex. I think another company had taken them over. And it has to have ADSB um, capability to be able to test the ADA, to, uh, test the ADSB system, particularly for installations. You can't just go through, install the equipment on the aircraft, and then go through and, and show it on your iPad, and I'm going to go. That's not a valid test of the parameters for the ADSB system test. Now, if I have a malfunction or a system or receive a report from the FAA, then I need to have this test equipment back to be able to check the radio integrity of the system. And like I said, I'll cover that in another section when it comes in. Okay, it's used to verify the integrity valid and integrity of the validity of the various inputs that come in. And you'll see on the UAT, this is the Universal Access Transceiver ADSB general page, it shows you target information, other target information, altitude rate, altitude reporting, waypoints, uh, waypoint altitude, all sorts of the, of the individual parameters that can be read through the downlink, uh, downlink format or the ADSB out forming, format. So these are things that have to be verified uh, for return to service. Let's talk about pedostatic certification. For 1090ES, aircraft that operate under mode S, okay, I'm going to say in general, those are large aircraft, jet aircraft that operate under air data control, uh, air data computers, which means that the air data computers will have um, uh, maintenance programs for instructions for testing the altitude output. That's okay. Okay, now for 1090 universal access transceivers or basically rest of general aviation, we need to do a uh, FAR 91219 altitude verification test. And this is the same test that we call the IFR certification, meaning it's the pedostatic check or the static system check that requires a validation of the pilot's main source of indication is valid to now the transponder blind encoder and what the ADSB system is reading. So moving forward, who can do this test? And there was a lot of questions that came up about that. One of the questions we had when I was at the FAA um, uh, Academy last week was talking about who can do the 91217 inspection. And I can tell you right now, it is an instrument check, which means it's outside of what an aircraft mechanic do can do. For example, an aircraft mechanic is allowed to do the static system check of an aircraft. They can use this piece of equipment or some equipment like it and check to see the leak down rate of the static system for this. But that's the end of it. To be able to do the certification check of the altitude source, you must have either be a manufacturer or an airline under a camp program or a repair station with at least an instrument rating or a limit of specialized service that covers this type of test. And it has to be done every two years. Otherwise, you can't operate the aircraft in any of the airspace. Oops, come with me here. There we go. So, where do I find the information about to ensure that this is a valid installation? In the paperwork and records, if it was a legal installation done by a, a certificated mechanic and certified, you should see a Form 337. 
on the back of the Form 337 should have somebody that wrote this statement and said, the installation ADSB out system was showed to meet the requirements for equipment and perf- uh, meet the equipment performance requirements, 14 CFR section 91227. Okay. If it doesn't have this statement, the system is not legal to be used. So we need to have that in the data. Okay, FA monitoring. Like I said before, every time the system turns on, the uh, equipment will go through a self-test functions. Okay, after that, when the aircraft flies, the FA is looking at it. If it's invalid data, if it's if it's data that doesn't coordinate with the mode C information, um, or it some of the other problems were having to do with the air squad switch not being set up to where it wouldn't t- turn off when it was on the ground or it wouldn't turn on when an aircraft lifted up. You can, as the owner, send a request to the FAA. There's a website here um, which has an email request, and you'll say, hey, I want to do a check. So the pilot will set up a test flight, and you'll uh, the pilot will set up the aircraft's end number. They need to know the ADSB manufacturers and model numbers what position source manufacturers? Like, for example, for the, for the little Jeep ADSB out that is in the tail cones of aircraft, you've probably seen these quickie put on uh, units. Those are actually the uh, positioning source. Some will use the aircraft's WAS information, and WAS capable, if it's a Garmin or um, some other Honeywell or some other manufacturer. Uh, the model number. You're also going to give the date and time and location of where you're going to be flying the aircraft. Go to your test flight, uh, and I need to talk uh, in a later section about what happens if that test flight's not done uh, correctly. Now, there are some failures that had to do with the fact that if you taxi too soon after runway, uh, after you leave the runway, or you don't come to a complete stop, you actually would get a failure from from uh, the ATC, ADSB monitoring, because it can't tell when the flight ended. Uh, we'll talk about that when we go through the, uh, uh, there's another section that I'm going to cover on, on this channel talking about ADSB failure mates. Let's see. Um, and that was really what I wanted to talk to you about in this just short period of time, just give you something to look at that was not uh, all doom and gloom from all doom and gloom from the news. Hello, everybody. I'm back. Um, what I wanted to talk about real quick was if you wanted more information or more uh, more qualified. Now, this is one of my first. In fact, this is one of my first. This is one of my first webinar training sessions, and I hope that to the, that I get more comfortable being in front of the camera. Uh, when you're an instructor and you're working in a classroom, it, it's easier to interact with people. You could read their faces. Um, I had a friend um, or a family member, excuse me, that works in California. He just got notified that, hey, you're going to be a online instructor right now. And he knows very well what it takes to teach an online course. I've been learning for the last year of how uh, how much work it does take to put it out an interesting online course. I am working on an online course, and I'll have a link when this uh, when this is rebroadcast. Uh, I'm going to kind of clean up this video and then put it back out on YouTube so you could review it at a later time and also include the links to the avionics education slash thinkific, which has uh, where I'm going to be hosting my online courses. Some of the online courses that I do at thinkific will include uh, I do a transponder certification right now. Uh, this was done at the request of somebody who was obtaining a repair station certificate and didn't have any technical training to show to, as part of their training program for the repair station. So he knew that I had taught, a friend of mine knew that I had taught uh, an avionics program and transponder or pulse radio principles was part of that program. So that is one of the first courses I'm putting together. If you go to uh, avionics education forward slash, I think forward slash or dash thinkific, you'll find an introduction to that course. Uh, sign up for it. Take a look at it. A couple of the courses I have getting ready to uh, go on air. In fact, probably the first session is I've decided to pull the trigger and do an online NCAT certification course. Uh, again, I understand what it takes to produce a course. I already have the textbook and I already have the worksheet book. So I'm going to start putting out videos for the NCAT online certification course, um, AET, AET. And then I want to move into radio communications add-on ratings. 
And let me talk about the add-on ratings here for, for a moment, if I could. In the last year, the Aircraft Electronic Association, this was a trade group that helped out small avionic shops uh, navigate the FAR, uh, FARs and the FAA system, actually got permission from the FAA headquarters to allow repair stations to issue a repair certificate under Part 65 to those technicians who have an NCAT AET and one add-on rating. Well, I've been selling uh, the NCAT AET courses and the textbooks for going on six or seven years right now. I've had really good success with the live courses outside of the logistics of having to get somewhere and then run the course. But it's been well worth it for me to come face to face and actually talk, <coughs> excuse me, and actually talk to uh, people at classrooms. I'm a classroom instructor. I like interacting with, uh, with people's faces and not a single eye, which is what I'm looking at right now. <coughs> Excuse me. So what are the, so now with the add-on ratings, the NCAT we understand, but the add-on ratings were the radio communications, which I'd like to do first because I have been working on a textbook for that. And I'll have that done <coughs> shortly. The other one was dependent navigation which was uh, VOR, ILS, DME, GPS. These are things or systems that were dependent on an outside source for navigation. And then we had autonomous navigation. Autonomous navigation was the flight instruments and the inertial navigation, attitude heading reference systems. These were more internal or, or uh, internal to the aircraft navigation systems. In other words, how does the airplane know what altitude is at? How does the aircraft know if it's what it's heading, if it's straight and level? So that was autonomous navigation. There was onboard radio communications and safety systems that was part of, uh, that I taught as part of my radio communications class. And we did passenger address systems, intercom systems. And at the same time, I covered cockpit voice recorder and we did flight data recorder because it was a similar system. And then the course that this is part of today that you've talked about, is just a taste of the transponder certification course. Under the transponder certification course, that was part of a bigger course, course called Pulse Radio Systems, which ties into a repair station rating. These are part of the radio rating. Pulse Radio uh, Systems or Pulse Radio Systems Operations was weather radar, the transponder radar, uh, transponder system. DME is a pulse radio system and so is radio altimeter. Uh, and included in that class, I included the safety systems, which was traffic collision avoidance system, terrain warning augmentation systems, TA, and uh, ground proximity warning systems, which are all tied to radar and, and uh, radio altimeter systems. So that's another course that I, again, over time, out of that 650 hours that I created, is going to be put online eventually. So go ahead and, and check out my Thinkific site. Go ahead and sign up for a course. You don't have to pay anything. I've set up all my courses to where you could pay for them in segments. If you have AF Cool, in other words, you're separating or getting ready to separate, or if you're still in the military and you want your NCAT certification, I set up the payment schedule to where you could get your certification through the course and then pay for it later uh, when you get your certificate. So if you like the video, if you don't like the video, I want to hear about it. Give me critiques. I always try to improve my presentation. I always try to produce. So don't forget to hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, and make a comment down below. And thank you for putting up with me for the last 35 minutes. This is session number one, the Corona, uh, Corona 2020 pandemic session tomorrow. I'm going to cover uh, ATA chapter 20 section on uh, electrical connectors which is an avionics, an air carry avionics course. So with that being said, we'll see you tomorrow.